Um, good morning or af good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. Um, my name is Gil Barros. I'm a partner product manager in the cloud platforms business unit at Red Hat. Um, what that means is I herd cats um, for a living. Uh, I work with partner engineers, partners, Red Hat engineers, other product managers, and uh, I don't know, I, I make things go, I guess. Um, well, they make things go, I just poke them every so often. Um, I apologize if you notice me fading like 10 minutes into this. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning for me and I feel like I haven't slept because I didn't. <laughs> um, but uh, so two fun things about me. Um, this is my day job, on my off time I fly airplanes and I don't wear lavalier mat, uh, microphones because they get stuck in my beard and it's a terrible experience for everybody. <laughs> you know, so I mentioned that's AV and they're like, yeah, that's totally a thing that happens. Like he was very happy that you want to take the hand mic. Yeah. Um, so how's that for an intro? So uh, my name is Jason Dobies. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. Um, if you've never heard the role, uh, it basically means I do cool shit with OpenShift and then run around the world telling people about it to get them excited for it. I already see smiles based on that description, so that's a good start. Um, as for two interesting things about me, this is very difficult because he just told me this literally as he was walking out. Um, <laughs> so that's my day job. My night job is I'm an adjunct professor um, teaching software engineering. Uh, and I guess, uh, as you guys heard this morning, I can now put author on my resume. Um, and I, I'm trying to keep this very professional air, but if you see me upstairs kind of cradling a book like a baby, don't be surprised. It's my first book. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> and you can buy it on Amazon? You can get it upstairs. <laughs> Even better. We have plenty. It's even easier. We're going to talk about the book in a second. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> All right. Looking behind me. OK, so we're going to talk about sort of we've learned over the last two to three years, two and a half years, um, with operators, right? Like what, what are best practices? What's worked well? What hasn't? What are operators? Um, really sort of best practices on uh, creating well-behaved operators that work well at scale. Um, and I think I don't like reading slides because I think it, it's, it's lazy of me, but this is a slide I'll, I'll read. So every application on any platform is going to be installed, configured, managed, and upgraded over time, right? So you're going to performance tune it. You're going to add content, remove content, change users. There's going to be fixes, patches, security vulnerabilities you are going to make changes to applications, um, whether you want to or not. Um, and the, I think the, the, these are sort of basic functions, right? It's, it's things that we can automate uh, hopefully easily. Um, it, it feels like low-hanging fruit. Somehow we haven't automated this easily over the last 100 years of computing. Um, but it, it's still low-hanging fruit, and I think it's where operators really shine, right? Um, when we're talking about resizing and uh, upgrading, we're really talking about careful orchestration, not just scale, right? It's scale, it's mess with quorum, it's add things to load balancers, it's in both directions. Um, for reconfiguration, we're talking about uh, which users have permissions to tweak which tunables, right? Which tunables are actually really safe for, to be tweaked and which ones aren't. Um, complex things about backing up databases, right? Do you need to quiesce this first? Do you need to stop a service? Do you need to you know, turn off some outbound APIs? Uh, things like that. So, sorry, and, and this is my crutch because it does feel like I've been up all night. So I apologize. Um, so the previous slides are really examples of what an operator can do and what we should be doing with operators. So let's talk about what actually is an operator. Um, they've been mentioned in most of the talks already today, which is cool as kind of a lead up to ours to get interest. And I know post lunch, everyone's just kind of fading into a food coma. So hopefully at least the, the, the relevancy of the topic will kind of perk people up. Um, let's start at the fundamentals. At the end of the day, it's a pod. It's a running pod inside of your OpenShift cluster. We talk about them like they're magical and they've got all these great properties. And that's not to trivialize it, but when you're visualizing it and trying to understand all of the moving parts, the first thing to realize is at the end of the day, it's just a running application. Now, not every pod is an operator. So where does the special sauce come in? Uh, it comes down to the fact that your pod or your operator has all of this very domain-specific knowledge about what your application does. 
It's able to do things that you would typically require a human to do that could take minutes or hours for them to respond to. Instead, we have this pod with this logic running inside of OpenShift managed by all of the OpenShift constructs. So that pod will stay alive if for some reason it crashes. My code doesn't crash, but if like your code crashes, um, OpenShift will bring it back. So you gain all of the benefits of application management through OpenShift, but it's got this extra ability of this pod to manage your application. So I said it's just a pod, but at the end of the day, um, it's gotta be more than just that. So it's really a paradigm of how you use your application. Now we heavily leverage uh, a built-in construct to OpenShift and Kubernetes called custom resource definitions, or CRDs for short. Uh, the idea here is everything is a resource in OpenShift. We have deployments, we have routes, we have pods, and these are our things. These are our tangible resources that we're dealing with. Well, what about if I wanted to define my own? Let's say I wanted to make Jay's awesome database as a resource. Uh, and that database is gonna need things like routes and secrets and config maps, and it's gonna need multiple pods and deployments. I don't wanna have my users go through all of that process and hand them hundreds of lines of YAML and say, edit these 17 lines in particular, or manually create these, and then once that's done, then you gotta deploy these resources. I wanna give my users the ability to say, what do I want? this awesome database. So that's the object I'm gonna create, or that's the resource I'm gonna create. So the custom resource definition, the CRD, this is the definition of that type. And it's gonna include things uh, like saying what users can specify. So these are the variables that, when you're creating this awesome database, you can um, go and fill in these values, and then the operator is gonna take care of putting them where necessary. Next slide. Uh, so we have our custom resource definition. Uh, many people will call that the API that the users are gonna use to interact with our operator. I always wanna pose whenever I see someone take a picture of a slide. Find me later and send me that picture. Um, what was I talking about? Operators. Uh, so we have our custom resource definition. That's what our users work with. Um, what happens on the server? Well, the operator, in addition to being a pod, it's a Kubernetes controller. It gets hooked into OpenShift to respond to events, specifically events about these custom resources. And this triggers off this reconciliation loop. So something has changed in my resource. It's been created, it's been deleted, uh, we've had a configuration change. The operator gets notified. Hey, one of these resources that you're responsible for has had an event, figure out what to do. The operator then takes over, goes through this reconciliation process to take the desired outcome from the user, so what they specified in that custom resource, and make the actual state match that. All right, so let's get into some of the details on uh, what makes a good, sort of a well-structured operator, right? Like what's, what's worked? I, I teased in the beginning with the, this talk is about what we've learned, so let's, let's get there. A little bit of an eye chart here. Um, you guys have access to these slides afterwards. I'll have access to the recording at some point as well afterwards. So we're not gonna read through all of these. Um, the main one for me is an operator should do one thing, one thing only, and do it really well. It should deploy your app, not handle any crazy dependencies. It should deploy your app, that's it. And do that really well, understand your app. So remember, an operator effectively relates back to a controller. If you're not too familiar with the internals of OpenShift, controller is just basically sounds by, uh, it's what it sounds like. It controls some particular facet of a custom resource. So you really shouldn't double dip. You shouldn't have some Uber controller that handles all of your custom resources. Um, one of the talks earlier, I forget who mentioned it, uh, about doing one thing very well. Microservices should do one thing and do that one thing very well. Similar pattern applies here. You should have one controller that understands how to do that custom resource definition, and that's it. And that's gonna give us the ability to uh, set up dependency management where my operator can rely on multiple other custom resource definitions and then that dependency management's gonna get uh, resolved for us. But we'll talk about that in a few slides. You're gonna see this repeated uh, with operators. It's like focus on one, one thing at a time. Don't add unnecessary complexity. Um, and, and part of not adding a necessary complexity is use an SDK, right? Like have that, all that scaffolding has already been created for you in an SDK, and we'll talk about the operator SDK and the operator framework a little, lady, a little later. Um, I'm gonna cheat and do one more here because I just noticed that this is a, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. APIs <laughs> stick around much longer than we expect them to. 
we're still using old versions of some Amazon API somewhere to do something to you know buy new soap every month, right? Like those APIs stick around. So you know, do proper versioning, do proper handling of APIs so that you know you can deprecate them and you can move from one to another. Um, another one for me. So I'm. One of the other things I do is I'm on the, the team, or I help on the team that does validation of new operators that get submitted to us for us to put into Operator Hub. We'll talk about Operator Hub in just a minute. Um, so maybe once a week, twice a week, I'll go and like go into GitHub, look at one of the pull requests, grab the operator, and I'm going to try this out. Right? Like, let's see if this works so that then I can push it into the, into the repo. And eh, about 50% of the time, um, there are really poor messages about status. And think about, think about your users, right? So your user may not know your application well enough to debug the operator for you. So you want to facilitate that as much as you can. You want to make it so that if something goes wrong, you make the clearest possible error message. And we just saw this early on. There was a, we were trying something, and it failed, and there was an error message, and it's like a hex dump, right? And it's like, how is this useful to anybody? <laughs> I'm sure there's that one guy, right, who wrote the, all the errors, and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, ABC37999 is, well, okay, that's great. That doesn't help me. <laughs> so, so please write meaningful status information. Um, it's, it's a big deal. So I come from a developer background, um, and I can tell you in my entire experience, um, we developers are historically bad at thinking about upgrades. Um, we like to just kind of trash the system and, and rebuild it. I'm seeing a lot of just horrified looks, and then that one guy in the back is crying, thinking about upgrades, and that's cool. I see you <laughs> back there. Um, they, it, it's very important that your operator is not going to do it right in the first try. Again, mine will, but yours all will have some issues. You'll need to push out upgrades. Status um, information, see? If, when it doesn't go right, have good status. That's right, and fix your status information so we don't get hex codes. Uh, you should be able to support this process. And again, we keep alluding to uh, OLM or this lifecycle manager, but it's going to understand that, hey, a new operator release has been pushed out. Uh, how do I get this into my cluster, and how do I let the operator take over keeping my application upgraded and up-to-date. Yeah, and it, I think when we're talking about upgrading and up-to-date, I think, uh, think back to the keep it simple, right? I don't want to upgrade from eight versions ago to the current version in one step. We, the operator framework provides tooling to help you do upgrades, right? It, it, there's a subscription model that we're going to talk about later. Upgrade from the previous version. Have the previous version of the operator upgrade from the previous version of that. Like, don't, don't make your life harder. Keep it simple. Um, so the other one that we highlighted is uh, another one from my experience testing operators <laughs> is I don't know anything about your app. Your user who is going to operatorhub.io, the, the operator marketplace, that is just trying this out to decide if they're going to give you money or not, probably doesn't know very much about your app either. So make it so that the defaults, default configurations work. Right? They don't have to be wonderfully tuned for any situation. But they should work, right? They should work on a reasonable test infrastructure. I, don't expect the default situation to be there are 90 CPUs available. That, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so if it'll, if it'll deploy and come up without user input, you'll have happy users that'll turn into buying users. So um, how do we do this? I'm guessing you guys memorized the previous two slides. Um, as part of the Q&A, we're going to turn it around and we're going to quiz you on all of the slides for the day. And those two are big ones coming up. Um, so we talked about the operator framework. Yeah, does this lead into? Yeah. OK, uh, so the operator framework, you may have heard this term before, but it is a series of three projects um, related to I was going to say writing operators, but it's ultimately everything. Writing operators, installing them, uh, updating them. So we'll start at the top here, operator SDK. Um, writing an operator is, not going to lie, kind of tedious. Uh, all the stuff I mentioned before, writing the custom resource definition, which is a couple hundred lines of YAML, uh, writing the Kubernetes controller, writing all of the hooks to tie it in, all of the handling logic, and so on, uh, it gets out of control real fast. 
Um, but that's OK, because we have this SDK to facilitate a lot of it. Um, and it's a very simple process of basically saying, I want a new operator. Here is the base language I'm going to use. And it's going to produce a ton of scaffold code for you, um, really just putting you at points where you implement your specific business logic. I mentioned before that reconcile loop that handles when a resource has changed basically drops you right there and says, OK, here, enter your code. We're going to see in a few slides there's some other options as well in addition to doing Go code. But back to the SDK, uh, it has some testing, some linting type constructs in there. So everything around building your operators is uh, made much more simple through using an SDK instead of handcrafting all of these parts. Now, Operator Lifecycle Manager, OLM, the easiest way to think of this is what yum is to RPMs. Or I suppose DNF is the way to, uh, the one to, example to use now. Uh, so I ins would say yum install Emacs. Instead, in the operator world, I'm going to say OLM, I want you to subscribe me to the Couchbase operator. Or I want you to um, subscribe the entire cluster to this etcd operator. Or some type of um, machine operator that's running your nodes. And it handles all those upgrades. Uh, like I said earlier, where you should be able to upgrade your operators, you can trigger OLM to say, all right, automatically when you see a new operator in the channel, roll it out to the systems. Or wait for manual user intervention so we can review what's going to happen. So OLM handles, not to reuse the word, but the life cycle of your operators, the cataloging, the installation, the upgrades, and so forth. And then the last piece, operator metering. Um, this is all cool, but is anybody actually using it? Uh, so the operator metering project is all about understanding the usage of your operators in terms of deployments, um, but as well as cluster resources, such as CPU and memory. So I think one of the, OK. <laughs> so I think what the, to me the, beautiful, the beauty of OLM is sort of the subscription model, right? The idea that you've subscribed to this operator and you're saying, just keep it up to date on my cluster. Of course, you can turn that off, but the idea of operators is they're going to be able to seamlessly upgrade from one version to the other without breaking, or if they do break with good error codes, remember that. Um, so it's the, the, the idea of a subscription is really um, the beauty here for me. So let's look at the uh, sort of 10,000 foot view of how this works, or 3,000 3, kilometer view of how this works. Um, so we're thinking about personalities, right? There's the developer, there's the admin, and there's there's a, maybe a user. Um, I, I've done this talk in a couple of different countries now, and I think in the US I used like John and Mary and whatever. Um, I did it in, in Milan a couple, few months ago, and it was like Luca and so and so and so and so. And uh, so in the here I started with um, Megan and, and Harry, and I think Archie is his name. But I mean, let's be clear, it, we were fine with this. And then my wife, I work at home, and she kind of overheard that. She's like, uh, dumbass, do you pay attention to the news? Right. And I'm like, no. And she's like, you're going to want to change this. Right. So maybe it's not a good idea. We have new names. <laughs> they live in the US now. I don't know. So maybe we'll use in Canada. In Canada, I'm sorry. <laughs> I already got, see, I get myself in trouble every time. I love that. As concerned as Diane was at the time, she stopped the talk to specifically call out Canada. <laughs> Let's all acknowledge that happened. So this is Kate. Um, <laughs> Kate is the developer. So Kate's going to use the operator SDK, right, which already has all of this framework. So what Kate is going to focus on is moving that logic that's in her head about how to lifecycle this application and add that to the scaffolding, and then poof, out the other end comes a Kubernetes operator. Um, so I'm going to intersperse these with little tidbits about operators. Um, so that was Kate back there. Um, we've uh, sort of come up with this idea of the operator maturity model, right? So that we can put operators into buckets depending on how advanced they are. Um, and it's also a good way for you to sort of tell your customers or for your internal or external customers you know, what your operators can do based off of sort of a simple concept. Right? Phase one and phase two are the obvious, I can install this application and I can do seamless upgrades, patches, et cetera. Um, phase three is you can do act real life cycle, right? like handle failure recovery, backup, all that kind of stuff. Phase four, deep insights, alerts, uh, handle log processing. Um, and, and the super cool phase five autopilot uh, is, is really about scaling and healing and 
you know, scheduling tuning for three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, whenever that day was, um, instead of, you know, noon on, on Black Friday. Um, so there's, uh, there's three ways you can approach this. You can use Helm, Ansible, or Go as your uh, operator logic. Um, Helm allows you to do the phase one and phase two. We've talked, I think we've seen in a couple of slides already today about how um, Helm is available, um, but it doesn't provide the full breadth of capability. Um, Ansible uh, does provide the, the full breadth of capability, but you don't have quite as much flexibility as in Go. I think the, the, the benefit of Ansible is you've maybe already got in-house developers who know how to handle Ansible, or you've already got some playbooks. Um, so you can you know, sort of hit the ground running. Um, the, the Golang idea is you really have more rich control over logic of handling what, what you're seeing, what the alerts are, and things like that. Different capabilities. So this slide could be very quick then. Uh, I mentioned earlier the SDK will generate a project scaffold for you, um, which is great, uh, especially if you're a Go developer. But I had partners in particular who came to me and said, hey, we already have uh, invested in Ansible, or we've invested in Helm, and we don't want to maintain two installers. And, and i got to admit, I can't blame them. Um, so the SDK has the ability to generate these scaffold projects for Ansible, Helm, and Go. Uh, the Helm one in particular can be based down to a single line. So it's this SDK command where you hand it in an archive of the Helm charts, and out pops the operator. And it ties everything up as necessary. Um, you can obviously still customize beyond that. Ansible is very similar. It'll either uh, generate you a blank um, word playbook, okay. um, or um, you can point it to an existing playbook and series of roles and say, hey, I want you to generate an operator that uses this existing stuff. So the important point off of this slide is if you already have these technologies in play, you don't have to abandon them. You can just use them seamlessly with operators, and then all of the extra stuff that comes along with operators. Again, OLM, this uh, CRD-based interface that your user use, end users are going to use and so forth. Um, so. William comes into play here. Do you, do you guys shorten uh, his name? Will, Billy, no? no. Billy. His Royal Highness. His Royal Highness, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm foreign. That sounds longer. <laughs> Hope that wasn't shortened, right. So um, William will take the, the operator that Kate developed. Uh, they'll add some metadata that's specific to his environment, to his clusters, uh, package it all up, and then make them available in OLM locally, right? So then the user can see in, in GitHub, in his, I'm sorry, not in GitHub, in, in Operator Hub, um, which operators are available for his clusters. Uh, yep, in, in the catalog. So I, I promised we were gonna intersperse these. So, <laughs> This is my, uh, my continuation on harping on subscription and updates, right? <laughs> so your operator should do one thing well, is manage that app. It should be able to update from the previous version, so just n minus one to n, keep it simple. Um, and because of the subscription, it's, it, it should just, the expectation is that it's just going to do that, right? It's just you're gonna subscribe to this operator and allow it to update itself linearly. Um, and each of those operators preferably should be related to a specific version of your app, right? The operator itself isn't your app. Your, the operator life cycles the app. So your operator version 112 um, installs, maintains, life cycles uh, your app version 3.0 and up from there. You can do this. Don't. <laughs> you can do this by having, you know, create versions in your CRD and say, oh, if I've configured it to install this version, install this version. Don't do that. You're making your life harder. You're making your operator more complicated. It's not necessary. Just have one operator deploy one version and be able to upgrade from just the previous version. Keep it simple. So OLM, uh, I said earlier, provides some dependency resolution. And the important part to remember is the second column up here, is that your dependency resolution is based on the CRD. 
So I don't say I'm reliant on this database operator. I say I'm reliant on this database resource. Um, I can specify a version, but I typically won't want to. So my operator can chain down. If my application ends up needing a message bus and a database and some other features, all of those are their own entities. They're their own operators, their own entries in uh, OLM. I just specify in my metadata, hey, I'm relying on these particular resources, and OLM resolves which operators to install and maintain from there. So we're back to the, the last step. Um, and I wasn't sure if I should do George or Lewis for the user. I don't know, should I do the older one, the, the youngest one, I, I don't know. I, I figured I'd already got myself in enough trouble uh, saying they lived in the US that at this point it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so Lewis, or George, uh, is on his cluster and he browses the, the uh, Operator Hub page, um, looks at the catalog and says, oh, here are you know, eight operators that I have permission to, to subscribe to. And then he can then subscribe to that operator and it will go and create the application and manage the application. Um, you've seen this before as well uh, today. Uh, OperatorHub.io has is the community version um, showing all of the, the different operators that we have over there available. Um, and if you click through, there's details on the operator. There's how to deploy them on your cluster or subscribe to them, rather. Um, but we also wanted to highlight uh, in Operator Hub, sort of the maturity level four and maturity level five operators, right? So maturity level four was, it can do metrics, alerting, log processing, um, workload analysis, and the level five, the autopilot, you know, has the, the fun scaling, vertical and horizontal scaling, uh, config tuning, performance tuning, really the, the more advanced stuff out there. Um, there's a couple more that are coming with uh, level five. And usually we find that operators sort of progress, right? You, you first create an operator that's a level one, two, and then your next version is a little better and the next version a little better. So a lot of these guys have been uh, with us for a while and slowly improving their operators or adding more functionality to them. Excuse me. Um, and this is as of three days ago, I think we updated this slide. So if in the past three days you have updated your operator and put it up there, I'm sorry that it's not on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on the screen next time. All right. So basically out of time, though. We're out of time? So no, no, go ahead. you want to do the video? OK. Okay. okay. <laughs> so okay. We, we've already failed at the do it live or go home part. <laughs> so uh, we're not going home. Um, well. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I want to say, like, this was intentional. This was a backup. Um, my uh, cluster decided to. Never mind. Uh, OK, so uh, in this demo, um, going through the steps of deploying the couch base operator. Now, I really like this example, um, as you'll see over the course of the demo. It's only a couple more minutes. Um, but this first couple of steps that you see me doing up here, uh, I just created a secret. All the secret is going to do is feed into the uh, creation of the couch base cluster. It's just some user credentials that you'll see later when we log in. So we head up to Operator Hub. Um, we saw briefly up there, it was listing all of the possible operators, which is basically the screenshot we saw. Chose to install the couch base operator, uh, and it gave us the option of a number of channels. So channels are up to the end user to decide. I'm sorry, let me take that back. Up to the developer team to decide. Um, you can typically think of things like stable and, will you pause it for me? Uh, stable, beta, nightly, however you want to choose them. The other thing that was on that screen is, did I want to install my operator in a particular project namespace or cluster-wide? Typically, you only need operators at a project namespace, so things like a database. I'm just going to install this for my particular project. Uh, the more cluster-wide operations are things related to something like networking or machine management. OK, uh, perfect. That's where I want you. Uh, and hit play. So once we're inside the operator itself, it's showing us a list of all of the custom resource definitions. Uh, in this case, pause it again. I'm just going to stay over there. <laughs> um, uh, in this case, it gave us the option of a couch-based cluster. Now, this is a custom resource defined by the operator. You won't see anywhere in OpenShift or in Kubernetes a resource named couch-based cluster. This is provided by the operator. It gets installed in the system. 
And then you can interact with OpenShift as if it was a native resource. If I had the command line up, and if you, any of you are command line users, you used to OC get pods or OC get deployments, you could say OC get Couchbase clusters. And I'll show you all of the Couchbase clusters. Now, at this point, um, it's springing up a normal YAML definition. A little hard to read. Um, by the time I hand these off to Diane to send out afterward, I do have a video of this on YouTube, which will be a little bit easier. Um, but you can edit the YAML like normal, and that's going to be uh, resources. No, this is good. Keep this one going. Hold on. I just wanted to, to say the, the only thing he edited there was the secret, right? So he created a secret before, and he just changed it so that it would refer to the secret that he created before. So, no, it's no problem. Uh, so all of our settings that we entered, uh, or I should say left at the defaults, uh, the number of nodes in the cluster to create, uh, all of the other database stuff that's well beyond my expertise, uh, all of those values get used by the operator to deploy the necessary pieces. Uh, the top and the bottom, the light green icons are services. That middle one you can see is the first of the three pods that are going to get deployed by the cluster. And you can see them slowly starting up. Um, this is the operator taking care of my desired uh, request of give me a cluster of three nodes and slowly starting to fulfill that. And there can be any number of reasons why they're doing it serially. Being a good operator citizen means understanding that just because you're running inside the cluster and you have easy access to the APIs doesn't mean you should slam them with a whole bunch of requests. So it's a lot simpler for an operator to deploy uh, a couple hundred items than it would be for me using a, a number of different YAML files. So it's important for the operator to be cognizant of the fact that, yes, there's other workloads going on, so don't hug everything to yourself. So we're still inside of the view for this particular resource, this example resource for the demo. Uh, again, a little bit hard to read, but you can make out some UI widgets on there. Uh, these are the configuration options for this particular resource. Um, so these are values I can set in the YAML. Uh, and in the next example, I actually go into the YAML and edit something. Um, but again, you saw some rocker switches in there for Booleans. It's possible to indicate some metadata for lists or enumerations. Uh, and OpenShift will take that metadata and render it into a UI for users. So now what I did in this case was enabled the web UI console into Couchbase. And you'll see me log into that in a second and pull it up. So editing this resource, again, I didn't have to say create me a service. Um, I will create a route shortly. Is it playing? Uh, yes. OK. Um, I will create a route to it shortly, but I didn't have to understand the mechanics of creating a service and what went into that. I simply flipped the value on the resource itself and said, for this particular Couchbase cluster, I want you to create the UI. I should have edited this. You can keep it going. There. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so we've, we've uh, configured the resource to have the web UI exposed. We've created a route to it. And I'm just simply logging you. We're going to use this in the next part. But this is what the Couchbase UI looks like. So for the last piece, um, you're going to see me go into the Couchbase resource itself. I'm going to edit the YAML. And all I'm doing is saying, instead of three nodes, I want four nodes. Again, I'm not creating any new deployments. I'm not manually saying I want to create a new pod. All I've said is, for this particular cluster, um, I want you to have uh, four resources instead of three. What I highlighted on there, again, a little tricky to read, uh, was the status output. So within that resource is also contained information on um, information reported back from the operator. So that was a list of the nodes in it. It could be other status information about the cluster itself. It's probably a good place to stop it. Um, so the operator, and this is where the operator part really comes into play. Instead of just saying, instead of three nodes, I want four nodes, it's not that simple in a Couchbase cluster. There's other database-y things that have to happen. And what this UI is showing at the very top, if you can see some red, it's saying one new node has been found, but we need to trigger rebalancing. Hit play for me. Uh, we need to trigger a rebalancing to smartly incorporate this new node into it. And that's what this uh, at the top right is. Is this that rebalancing operation that starts? So you may be thinking, OK, all you did was create a new pod, but it's more than that. 
and this is where the operator really shines. That domain-specific knowledge, that knowledge that Couchbase has that says, if I add a new, new node to the cluster, I need to do other stuff. I can't just say, um, create a new pod directly inside of OpenShift. Couchbase and the operator needs to know there's a new node in the cluster, I need to rebalance, I need to somehow start sharing the load across them. Uh, and this is just a small example of the types of domain stuff that an operator will take into account that I as the end user couldn't directly do through the OpenShift APIs. Awesome, yeah. I think that's, I think that's the big takeaway, right? It's, yeah, that was it. Um, is uh, operators are codifying that knowledge that you have in your head into a set of logic, um, be it in Golang or or, <laughs> or Helm. Um, yes. Hang on half a sec. Naz, can you get him on that and? Um, We'll, oh, just, we'll set up the other guys and you can take a few questions. Okay, sure. So, um, so I see everybody taking pictures of this slide. Again, they'll be available. Um, what you're seeing up here is links to a number of things. Uh, the special interest group, um, uh, a lot of the GitHub repositories, uh, and then as Dahan wanted me to mention earlier, the book signing upstairs at three o'clock is specifically about Kubernetes operators. Everything from understanding concepts to writing them using the SDK for Go, Ansible, and Helm, and then some philosophies around best practices and things like that. So okay, question? Come on over. And what is the policy up? enforcement point for uh, the operator? What do you so, mean by policy? From a security perspective. Do you, do you need to know? From a security perspective? Okay. So um, part, okay, great, great question. So an operator is the running pod. It's your custom resource definition. What I kind of skimmed over is that there's a series of RBAC settings that you also need to specify to give the operators permission to do things on the cluster. Now, operator installations, as of now, require cluster admin access because of that exact reason. I can install the operator and correctly scope it so that way it'll only be able to modify, say, the couch-based cluster-related items. Um, but from an, uh, a cluster admin perspective, I'll likely have wanted to review that. So OLM, when I installed the operator, ran those RBAC changes. It's a service account, it's a role, and they're role binding between them. Um, that stuff is all, again, generated by the SDK. So creating a new operator, I would run the SDK to make the new project. It spits out um, some default settings for the uh, authentication, or for the uh, security, which are extremely permissive because it doesn't know any better. Uh, one of your steps as the operator writer is absolutely to go in there and then start taking out permissions that it shouldn't have. But again, ultimately it comes down to the cluster admin is the one who installs the operator, so has that understanding of I, under, I know what I'm granting to the operator because it's gonna need to be able to do things like create pods, destroy pods, and so on. So What's that? An automation layer is becoming a manual validation and auditing. Uh, so I mean, at the be end of better the to have uh, a policy enforcement uh, on top of that. I mean, at the end of the day, there's always going to be, if you want to call that manual, sure, but you're always going to want a human looking at security things like that. Now, that said, any of the operators coming off of operatorhub.io, um, like Gil mentioned, I am actually was on that team, too, of reviewing them, so that is something we look at. Is Paul Christensen in here? So sitting upstairs waiting for people is a guy responsible for certification of operators. They absolutely look at that. So if you get an operator from Red Hat, you can be sure that uh, his team has taken a look at those permissions and understands it's not breaking things. One last point that I know Diane wanted me to mention. Um, everything we've mentioned up here is the existing operators and which are available in operatorhub.io, more customer-centric audience. Um, if there's anything missing that you would like added, specifically we need support for such and such a partner or such and such a business, uh, I mentioned Paul Christensen. There's another guy upstairs named Michael Waite. Um, if you've never met him before, he's, he's just, I was gonna say 6'6", six, six, but I don't, it's at like 5,000 centimeters, whatever the, the conversion is. Super tall, super tall dude. Just look up and that's Mike Waite. Um, find those guys and they'll be more than happy to hear about the kind of use cases you're looking for to either be able to tell you, yeah, we already have operators that do that, we have partnerships that handle it, or no, but I'm gonna go hunt someone down and I think this would be a great addition. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. They'll be available in the AMA at the end to ask more questions. 
So thank you for your question. Uh, now.